Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that will give you a skill set that will make you marketable for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach from Metro Atlanta. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent also from Atlanta, currently in North Carolina. And I'm David Williams, and I'm a dad from Chicago, Illinois. This week in the news, coal. Nearly one half of parents don't want their kids to go straight to a four-year college. A great article by Jill Barche in the Heckinger Report. Mark and Anika will discuss... Why is it so important to utilize my advisor and their knowledge? Our question from a listener is, how can a student demonstrate his level of commitment in one activity to explain his lack of involvement in others? Our interview this week and for the next four weeks is by a familiar voice, Mark Kantrovich, who's going to talk about the single biggest change in the 56-year history of the FAFSA, and he's calling it the New Simplified FAFSA. And there'll be no college spotlight for this week. Okay, friends, two quick announcements, one by me, one by Dave. Uh, Dave, I'll let you start out with yours. So we've had a request from some listeners who said, I love when Dave does his doctor thing. And so I feel, you know, anytime we can relate your doctor thing to education um, and to our kids, it makes a lot of sense. And I feel we've got an opportunity here. So what's going on, Dave, with uh, Johnson & Johnson Recall? Uh, explain what that is and how concerned people should be. And if you think it has any ramifications for, for whether or not uh, colleges will be residential in the fall. Well, uh, very interesting. I mean, this has been a point of discussion that we just had in the emergency room yesterday with many of the nurses who have received the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And we're now all paranoid about the statistics. So let's first talk about the facts. The facts is that there have been over 7 million doses of the Johnson Johnson vaccine given. And in that time, they have had six, count them, one, two, three, four, five, six cases of a very rare blood clotting disorder called cavernous sinus thrombosis. And and a couple of those, it's serious. And a couple Did you of those, just say cavernous bona bona bosis? I'm sorry, sorry, cavernous sinus thrombosis. It's, okay. I, it's a little That's tiny. why I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I couldn't get through the pronunciation. Yes, the blood clots that we're talking about are not the -the run-of-the-mill blood clots in the leg known as a deep venous thrombosis or blood clots in the lungs known as a pulmonary embolus. These are very specific, very rare blood clots that occur in the brain, and they're treated differently. And it's so rare that I think I've seen maybe two in my whole career. So, So this is very rare, and they've seen six of them. Okay. And in an abundance of caution, I really want to stress that abundance of caution phrase, they have decided to pull the distribution and the uh, administration of these medications until more can be known. And there's a lot of speculation about whether this is real or not real or so forth. But the statistic I want to really focus on when we try and evaluate how significant this is, is one in a million. Because that's what you're talking about here. You're talking about one complication in a million. And let's focus on what other complications there might be of common drugs that we also take. For example, birth control pills. If you take birth control pills, your chance of getting a blood clot is about 1 in 1,000 to 1 in 10,000. Uh, if you take Tylenol, the, the number of uh, deaths attributed to Tylenol use or overuse or so forth, there's about 400 a year. If you go into your car and drive to the supermarket, the case fatality rate for an automobile is about one per 10,000 ve- vehicles. So there's so many things that we engage in on a daily basis from taking an aspirin, a Tylenol, getting into our car that is so much greater than one in a million. That we can, we really, you know, there's a phrase that we have in medicine and it's called, you know, risk benefit proposition, recognizing that with every medication you give, there is a risk, every medication, but you always balance that with the potential benefit. In fact, one of the best phrases I've ever heard is that all medications are poisons with therapeutic side effects and you're trying to balance the therapeutic side effects 
with the potential for an adverse reaction you get in every single thing we do. All right. So when you look at one in a million, <laughs> you see that that in my prediction, I believe that this that this vaccine is going to be validated. I do believe that it's going to be put back in production. And I think they're going to find that the incidence of adverse side effects is certainly no greater than any other vaccine that we've taken or medications. And actually, the risk profile is significantly better than most. So you made an incredibly compelling case. And I would even go so far as to say it's probably less than that because, like, for example, I'm once vaccinated, about to get my second vaccine by the time that the same day this goes live. Yeah. But I'm Pfizer. You know, where I met, you know, Kip, where I work on the day, they are offering, you know, the whole thing for just for our school district, Moderna. So not everybody's even taking Johnson's on. So when you factor that in, the odds are even less. So I think that's really good, Dave. And, and then let's look at the big man. It's COVID. You know, I mean, you know, Mark, you know, my father died of COVID. He was yep. elderly. But, but the fact is the number of people that we have in our orbit with friends who have died of COVID. Nietzsche's brother. Effects. And Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's brother, brother died at 60. a bad disease. And what's really concerning me about COVID is these new variants. This is a smart virus. It learns every single wave. And we're now in our third or fourth wave, depending how you will define it. It's getting more contagious. It's getting deadlier. And it's affecting younger and younger people. So the existential threat of COVID is only growing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going away. And if you have two groups of people, and thank God I've been vaccinated now as, as my family has, but you have two groups of people, the, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, I would much rather take the risk of being vaccinated with a product that might give me an adverse reaction, one in a million, than go out in this world where everybody's relaxing social distancing and everybody's going back on planes where they're not taking out the middle seat and, and everybody's relaxing their guard and the virus is getting uh, more contagious and deadlier. I mean, that's the threat, you know, risk benefit folks, risk benefit. <laughs> you know? All right. Good stuff, Dave. Uh, nice. That was awesome. Nice addition. Okay. So my second announcement, and I'm hoping Anika's not listening to this episode because she listens to some and not all. But if you heard last week's episode, she did and now made a huge announcement She's transitioning to the substitute role on question for a listener. We're already retiring the book chapter after 171 anyway. Uh, but Anika gave so much of her time to and dedication. I mean, this is pure volunteer. This is not her career. This is what I do. This is my passion. She's just a parent trying to help out literally four years. And I want to do something for her. And so what I'd love it, if you're a listener and you've been positively impacted by anything that Anika has said in these almost four years, well, three and three months, but we put another six to eight months of prep in before we launched, so I'd count that. But if you could just send in anything from a sentence to a paragraph, actually send it directly to my email, just because Anika still can have access to questions at yourcosmoidkid.com, and she'll see it there. I want this to be a surprise. Send it to Mark, M-A-R-K, at school, S-C-H-O-O-L, Match, M-A-T-C-H, number four, letter U.com. So my company's called schoolmatchforyou.com, and my email is mark at schoolmatchforyou.com. Just send in a sentence to a paragraph. I'm going to hire like a calligraphist and put something together that she can keep as a tribute to her impact that she's had on everybody. I think it'll be special, and I'm trying to think of a way to really, really thank her beyond just words, and I think that would be something and so, once again, no obligation, but you'll know as a listener if you've been like, yeah, Anika's really helped me. I'm going to send my sentence or my paragraph in. And I'd ask that you send that in by the 10th of May. Uh, once again, mark at school, match, number four, letter U, dot com, by the 10th of May. Sound good, Dave? It does. And I just want to give a shout out to Anika. She has been so inspirational to to me, especially, I mean, she's got something called mom sense, you know. Uh, <laughs> she really does. You know, uh, in fact, my wife says, you men are so full of nonsense that you need to balance it with some mom sense. <laughs> I mean, she cures you from from reading. <laughs> <laughs> I can just hear Frida saying that. <laughs> we need mom sense, not nonsense. I have a exactly. feeling there's a lot of ladies that are nodding their heads and chuckling on that one. That's right. You know, you know, you got two guys 
on the podcast, you know, uh, uh, talking the way, you know, we're going to say some silly stuff. So you always need that balancing voice of reason. And that's what, what uh, Anika brought to the podcast with her knowledge of just raising three kids, getting them through the process. And she brought an emotional dimension uh, in which uh, I think people really related to, I mean, this is a very emotional um, thing, you know, getting your kids into college, the stress of it all. And, and, and Monika provided such a wonderful emotional balance that I almost like the holding your hand through that process while Mark provided all the dream crusher statistics. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to let that go. So, Anika, I just really want, from the bottom of my heart, want to really thank you for the role that you've played uh, in my life and helping me through the process, just as I listen to your words of reason and wisdom coming through the podcast. So I'm glad you're still in a, in a, in a substitute role, but your regular contributions will be missed. And I know Dave is 100% genuine because often when we talk, Dave's like, we can't lose Anika. You know, so <laughs> he's made that clear. All right, Dave, it is time for our tip, and I'm going to start out by a quote from a friend of the podcast, been on episode uh, three episodes around episode 50. I know he always lands on major episodes. He was on 50 when he was on 100, and that's the director of admission at Georgia Tech, Rick Clark. So I'm going to start with a quote from him and expand on it. And so as he says, I'm giving you the PG version, my single biggest advice to students at this time Quote from Rick, read your friggin' email, you know, because <laughs> so much stuff is lost because people don't read an email and they miss dates. They miss enrollment, at least to summer mount and lots of other things. I'm going to go a step further. I know we're we're this is a time we're trying to teach independence for kids, but just for the short little window between now and when your student actually gets to the college, particularly for you seniors, I'm referring to now. Give your parent access so you've got two sets of eyes. Double protection. You won't miss any important email. You can always change the password later once you're enrolled, but it won't kill you, particularly for you seniors and parents of seniors, for the next four months to have double eyes on those emails so you don't miss anything important. So that's that's our tip of the day. All right, Dave, I changed my vernacular. I had one I really wanted to do. But I push that one to next week because what I'm going to say today kind of kind of coincides a little bit with our with our article. And so it's a tough one. Not expecting to get it, but I'm throwing it out there anyway. The term is CTE programs. It's a term you'll hear admission officers throw around. What are CTE programs? CTE. Oh. I gave you a bit of a hint because it'll somewhat sync to what we'll talk about. Okay. Um, CT, oh, community, community transition, something like something to do with like community college. Okay. Not a bad guess. The answer is career and technical education. Okay. Career and technical education program. So Dave knows right away how that syncs to what we're going to talk about, but yes. I kind of uh, broke my rules. You you got last week's wrong typical assets, and I I sort of supposed to take my foot off the gas and give you a little bit easier one. But when I got one that sinks to to what we're talking about, I'm going to take that chance. So take advantage of that. So that's a good segue to introduce our article. Awesome. Now, Anika, as you know, I wrote out this big number thing last week Mm -hmm. that I do with Dave. And me, the big dummy, forgot to do it in week two. So... (laughs) Thanks to modern technology, I can do it with you and tell Nemanja to cut it, splice it, and inject it in the intro with Dave. So that's what we're going to do now. So the big number for this week is 40, 40. And what that refers to is the number of states, because we know they have 50 states, the number of states where the highest paid state employee is either the men's football coach or the men's basketball coach. The highest paid state employee is either the football coach or the basketball coach. Oh, okay. 40 of the 50 states. Wow. So if anybody questions whether sports brings in money to these institutions, you know football and basketball do because they're not paying you $5 million unless you bring 25 to 50 million into the institution. Mm, Wow. And that's that's why they do it because you say that's a 
perversion of education. Well, you know, how in the world could you say you care about education and the highest paid person in the whole state is the football coach? <laughs> That's because it's a business proposition. Football brings in 25, 50 mil. So they want to win and they know the difference between winning and losing is worth throwing five mil at somebody. So the big number, 40. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. Well, this article is by Jill Barche of the Heckinger Report, and it is called Nearly One Half of Parents Don't Want Their Kids to Go Straight to a Four Year College. Very interesting article. It was based on a poll that came out in Gallup this year, April 7th, 2021. And this poll was done by the Carnegie Corporation, a very well respected nonprofit uh, organization. So, Mark, let me just give a brief summary and we'll talk about it. Sure. And basically, it, it said that. of the parents in their poll would prefer for their kids not to go to a four-year college. And they uh, thought that this was a warning for the support for college education. Now, this poll had 3,000 adults with kids aged 18 to 25. And they said, why? what were some of the reasons that the parents gave that they didn't want their kids to go to college? Well, number one, rising tuition. Number two, disappointing graduation rates of colleges today. And number three, poor job prospects. And they said in lieu of the four-year training, uh, 60% would prefer their kids to have non-college vocational training. And 22% preferred that their kids would either A, start a business, B, join the military, or uh, C, do something in terms of uh, community outreach. And um, it was very interesting because they found that there were some differences racially. Black parents, 67% of them still had faith in the college process. But among Hispanics, that dropped to 56%. And shockingly, Mark, among whites, it dropped to 51%. And this, let me make a couple more points. Politically, not surprisingly, among Democrats, 70% still wanted their kids to go to college. But among independents, it dropped to 48 percent. Among Republicans, it dropped to 46 percent. So there's much more in this article, Mark. But let me stop here and see where you want to take this, because there's I I can see there's multiple jumping off points that we can take right now to discuss this. It really is. I mean, David, I literally could talk about this article for literally hours. It's, you know, it's so nuanced. And so uh, I make so many points. But let me start by saying this. I was a little naive about a trend until a few years ago. So your regular listeners know I'm director of college counseling at KIPP, which is the nation's large, largest charter school network. And that's an acronym that stands for Knowledge is Power Program. And so we're at a KIPP staff meeting, and we had a president from Clark Atlanta University at our staff meeting. And this is an elderly lady with literally over 50 years of education experience. So she startled me at first by making a comment, and she says, this new generation is unlike anything that we've seen before. They, you know, This is pre-pandemic, by the way, so this is probably three years ago. She says, they want to work from home. They do not want to be in the office all the time. So in the past, she said, I could say, hey, everybody in the office, we're going to make calls at 7 at night. No, they don't want to do that. She said, they value work-life balance, and they look at how hard people from my generation have worked, and they say, that's unhealthy. I'm not interested. And I've actually, now that I have 25 and 22-year-olds, I'm starting to see some of these trends with my own kids. I look at my own daughter, Karis. You know, Dave knows this. She's got a Spanish degree and a Spanish tutoring business. She actually had since she was in high school, 2012. And she um, is also a certified medical interpreter. So she had this opportunity to have what I thought was an amazing job, you know, working with the doctor's clinic. There were like doctors, dentists, physical therapists there. And basically, she'd rotate around amongst the office and be the certified medical interpreter so that they didn't have to know Spanish. And she couldn't use all and she had to learn all those, you know, all the medical terms, interpret them in Spanish. And then she turns the job down at first. You know, this is a a real gut check as a parent. You know, I'm like, didn't you go to school to do all this for that? And she's like, I don't want to be a corporate slave. She's like, I want to be an entrepreneur. And so she's like, I learned from you. But then she says. But 
I don't want to work seven days a week like you work. I'm going to the gym six days a week and I'm taking Sundays off. <laughs> and so I get to see like this new generation, how they think different. And it's trickling also into the parents. Now, one thing I'll say, um, and this is like you say, there's so many places we could go with this, Dave. One thing I'll just make a comment. I don't want to hang our hat here too long. But one thing that hit me was the the almost unprecedented challenge that admissions officers have right now because of a confluence of factors that are all coming at them at the same time. So they've got the demographic cliff. I mean, it truly is a buyer's market right now. And college is under so much pressure to in, just to have full enrollment. So you got the demographic cliff, which we've talked about before. After 20 to 25, there's going to be less 18-year-olds, so less people for the colleges to get if they're going after traditional students. They've got thousands of competitors already just in the four-year schools that are out there. The U.S. has so many colleges compared to other countries. So thousands and thousands of competitors. But then what this article deals with is probably, you know, the biggest challenge of all, which is the perception that what is being offered isn't that valuable and may not be worth it. The ROI may not be there because it's such an expensive proposition. And the reality is there's actually some truth in the short term to that. So one of the things that this article says, and I'll read a quote, it says in the short term, the two-year associate's degree and the training certificate are better financial bets. It says over the first decade, the return on investment for a two-year degree was 141000 followed by a certificate of 120000 and the four-year degree had a return of 71000 Now, the article does go on to say over the long term, that it's unmistakable that the bachelor's degree, the ROI is there. It shows the research that, you know, um, almost a million-dollar difference in career earnings for a bachelor's versus a high school diploma. But there's some truth to it in that regard. So that's a little bit of background. Now, let's get into some of the things you mentioned, Dave. Let's do a breakdown of what is it that people actually do want. So as Dave said, 46% of parents said they would prefer their, to not send their child directly to a four-year college. And the thing that's so fascinating about this article is it they, they tracked it amongst different income categories. It says, even if there were no financial obstacles or other obstacles at all, they still feel that way, which is, which is a way of saying that they don't see the value. They think there's better value in other alternatives. And when we look at the breakdown, well, what is it that they want if they don't want college? So we have 54% that want the four-year degree, okay? 8% want the two-year degree. 16% want non-college training, and 22% want alternative pathways. So if we combine the 16% non-college training with the 22% alternative pathways, we're talking about almost 40% of people are looking for some type of alternative education. And the article goes on to say, remember they surveyed over 3,000 people, what was it that people want? Well, let's take a look at that 22%. That's a big number who want alternative pathways. Starting a business, extremely popular. This is this gig economy that we're in. Joining the military, getting a job right out of college, or doing community service were the four things that people mention. But but Dave, let's let's you asked me where I want to take it. That you gave your preamble, your overview. I gave mine. I think where I'd like to take this is let's look at these various divides and let's talk about why they may or may not exist. So let's start out right away with um, the political divide, which is the first one they mentioned. So 70 percent of Democrats uh, want their kid to go to four year college right out of high school. And actually, 11 percent want two year college. So if you if you add the 70 and in the, in the if you add the four year, the two, you have 81 percent of Democrats that want to see students go to college directly out of high school. For, for Republicans, those numbers were 46% for four-year degree and 7%. So that's 53%. So you're talking about 82 versus 53. You're talking about basically a 30-point gap. So my question for you is, why do you feel there's such a political divide between what Democratic parents want for their kid versus Republican parents want for their kids? Well, first of all, I, I'd like to 
to point out that in all these categories where you look at the uh, racial divide, political divide, educational divide, and geographic divide, they're all consistent. So it makes sense because we know, for example, that most Democrats uh, are in the suburban area, and actually that's where more people uh, are for college. Uh, Education-wise, uh, we know there's a big gap between Democrats being more highly educated than Republicans. And of course, we see less educated people, less inclined to go to college. Uh, and ironically, we see that more Democrats are African-American uh, and more Republicans are white. So you're seeing more African-Americans as Democrats being predisposed to college. So, I, I, so there is a similarity, a commonality between all these statistical categories. So that's one thing. It makes sense between geography, education, political and racial preferences. That being said, I also think that when you look at the value proposition of college, where does college really give the biggest bang for your buck? In urban, diverse, geographical areas, right? Because if you're going to college and you're becoming a lawyer or a doctor or you're joining a corporation or you're learning the value of diversity by uh, working with other races and working with other political uh, other countries... Where does that make sense? In Chicago, in New York, in Atlanta, in diverse urban environments in which those skill sets are going to come into the play. However, if you're living in rural Nebraska or you're living in areas of the country that have not seen the same amount of economic impact of the changing technological society, you're going to be much less convinced that a college degree is going to make a difference because you're going to look around at your community and say, in 20 years, we haven't improved. And ironically, it's the same type of community that's not going to have the same type of diversity or uh, global political impact and so forth. So I see all these statistics and trends as being reinforcing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. It absolutely does. Um, you're not trying to avoid the political hot potato, though, and just go off are you, man, and take a circuitous route to take the easy way out on the politics. I didn't know whether you wanted this to go from your college-bound kid to David Mark's political hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want I'm that not. either. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the point is there's been an explicit messaging mm -hmm. uh, on the part of one of these political parties that has been uh, anti-education and uh, anti-intellectual. Uh, and, and we know this, and, and I think that that has had real reverberations. Uh, there's almost been a, a, an attack on the idea of higher learning. Yeah, I think that's true, but I think the way that the Republicans would frame it, colleges have become bastions of homogenous democratic thinking where conservative views are not tolerated, and there's a brainwashing of students inculcating them with values that we don't feel are consistent with our values. I think that's how they would say it. Okay. And I think there's some, like in some ways there's true and in some ways it's not true. It is, there's, it is true that if you go to schools like Brown, Wesley and Smith, Holyoke, Wellesley, just to name a few, you're not going to hear very many conservative voices and to the point where, you know, mostly what you'll get will be caricatures of that side. Um, and people have a tendency to feel stifled because when you're such a distinct minority, you don't find that many people around you that have your views. A lot of times you'll go silent. That's why, you know, having enough of a critical mass so that people feel at least, gee, I'm not the only one holding my views can be helpful so that you actually get the best arguments from the other side, even if it's not going to change your, your thinking, if that makes any sense. So I think that would be their argument. And I think there's some truth to that. Oh, on the other hand, there's also an aspect of as you become more educated and you learn things, you learn history. It's very difficult to learn history and to have a Tucker Carlson view that there's no racism. Yeah. Just, been, just putting it out there. Sorry, that may be political. I mean, I stepped on toes, but I'm just being honest. On a really real level, we know that for many, many kids, going to college may be the first opportunity they have to even interact with a different racial or religious group. For many kids, they, they may have never uh, interacted with an African-American or someone with Mexican heritage or someone who's Jewish 
or someone or Asian. who's Muslim or someone who's Asian, especially if you're coming from the the heartland areas and the rural areas where you could have a school that's 99% of one race. And so, so much studies has shown that the thing that causes people to be to broaden their horizons more than anything else is simply the ability to interact with other people. I agree. Other being of any category, you know. And, and I, I got to say this. I, I think that the Republican Party has become so much of a, an attack on otherness, uh, an attack on anything that threatens the traditional status quo, that they see all of education, higher education now, as being a threat because what higher education introduces to young kids, which is the tolerance for differences and the embracing of things that are new, is becoming an existential threat to the vision that the Republican Party is trying to propagate right now. So I agree with that. So let's transition. Let's talk about the parent education divide. And I do. I respect how you showed the continuity and the correlation between all of them. But let's just break it down. So. People with a bachelor's degree, 66% of people with a bachelor's degree felt like they wanted their kid to go to a four-year college. People without a bachelor's degree, 45% felt that way. So there's a 21% gap. That's significant. And I was, I'll give you my theory on this, Dave, and then, and then I'd like to hear your theory. So my theory is that those of us who have degrees have, we can see concrete ways in which our degree benefited us, not just as an enlightened human being or more enlightened than we were before we went to college, let's put it that way. Some of us are still trying to get enlightened, but we can see direct job benefits. Yeah. You know, in fact, you know, I know this would be true for you as well, Dave. I haven't had a single job since I've been, you know, out of college that I would, that I would have had if I, that I would have been able to get if I didn't have, have a degree. Yep. And so when we see tangible correlation between our degree and some life outcomes, we're going to value that. On the other hand, I think people that have not had a degree, there's a lot of cynicism about education and there can be a lot of stereotypes that maybe there's partial truth in there, but some of it just comes from an unknown. You know, you're living in a small town or rural America and you, you never went to college. You, you have certain views of college that you might find are very different if you actually went, but you're so far removed from them. So that's part of my theory on that. Do you, you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Education gives you the ability to take a wider perspective, especially of change, and to see where things are going and to see how things can suddenly become obsolete. And education gives you we, – we often talk about this phrase, Mark, being a lifelong learner. Yeah. What education enables you to do is to develop the skill set to continually learn and change and adapt. I want to give you a great example. I was reading an article just yesterday, Mark, on how the auto industry is going to change because by 2030, 50% of all cars are going to be electric. By 2040, probably 100% of cars are going to be electric. And the problem is, is that the uh, electric car has 10 times fewer parts than the internal combustion engine. So all those jobs, like 90% of jobs in actually building an internal combustion car are eventually going to go away in the next 20 years to be replaced by more technologically uh, advanced jobs of software integration as we look at how to integrate software with, with a very simple mechanical device, which is essentially an electric motor. Well, the fact is being educated allows you to read those articles and say, hey, look, my industry's changing <laughs> and maybe I should get a certificate degree in software integration or coding or whatever, because if all I do is stay put making carburetors or making this widget in 10 years, my job is going to be gone. So I think having an education allows you to recognize change to adapt to it, to prepare for it. And that's why I think uh, parents who, who have that education and have that broader v viewpoint are a lot more amenable to their kids uh, getting more, more educated. That lifelong learning uh, proposition never goes away. No, I think you're spot on. And, and on the racial divide, 67% uh, of blacks want their kid to get a four-year degree. If you go 56% uh, Latino, 51% white. 
I think that's partly explained by the reverse of what I said before, just like those of us who have education have seen how that has led to job opportunities for us. The percentage of whites with college degrees is noticeably higher than the percentage of blacks right now. So I think what you have there is people that are also aware of my lack of education yeah. has been an impediment. And if I would have had more, I might have had a better opportunity. And so there's an understanding of the value of it. I don't know if you agree or disagree on that, Dave. Absolutely. If you're a minority and you don't have an education, you're dead in the water economically. Uh, a lot of times if you grew up in rural areas and you had access to farms or traditional industries such as coal mining or forestry or so forth, you see a lot of examples even today where you can still sort of survive maybe without a high school degree. But if you're in inner city Chicago without a college degree and you don't have an education, you're unemployed, period. And not only that, you're not just unemployed, you're living in an area of poverty and crime. There's bullets flying overhead, literally. So you see the, the results of having a, a degree literally gets you out of a war zone and gives your family the chance to have a, a, a semblance of a normal life. Whereas without an education, you truly are stuck in, uh, in, in dire straits. Yeah, and I think this is one thing where sometimes they even have a slightly different perspective. I don't, I, I mean, I think what you said there, I'm sure it pertains to Chicago, but, you know, where I'm at, it's, I see a lot more of opportunities for people um, through, for example, we've got someone coming over here to lay sod this week, and then we also are in putting a sprinkler system in. Like, I was talking to the sprinkler guy. Um, you know, he's out of high school. He started this. He was working for somebody else for a while. His business is so booming right now that he's literally 12 installs behind and he's trying to hire people. So I see, see, I do see a lot of jobs in, in trades still. And, in um, you know, it does take a little bit of entrepreneurship and not everybody has that ability to kind of launch out and try something like that because of fear of failure or the confidence to even do it. But I think that, I think your point is well taken, but I do think it can vary a little bit depending on where you're where you're located, a little bit. Yeah, and I, I, I want to dovetail on that. I, I'm actually – having a trade is actually part of the education as well. So I want to – Okay, you know, if you include I, that, I, then, I, I, then we can agree. I, I, absolutely. In fact, even more so in Chicago, there's very little that you can't do without getting some sort of license or trade. So right, I don't right, know right, right. But unions certainly with, with – uh, you got it. Uh, yeah. In fact – you, it's actually much high, harder to become a plumber in Chicago because of the apprenticeship and the course that you have to go through than a lot of college degrees. So, so the trades are part of the educational process. All right, that's good. I'm glad you clarified that because I Absolutely. thought you were talking about four year degree. So that's important. No, that no, 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 no. When you make it, yeah, when you broaden it, then we then we agree. Now, I want to I want to close, Dave, on this. It's a so you mentioned this in your intro, and I'll read it. I'll read a exact quote from the article. It says, "Fueling the skepticism." Our legitimate gripes about three things, rising tuition, disappointing graduate rates at many graduation rates at many colleges and poor job prospects for some fields of study. And I say to all three of them, guilty as charged. Yes. Tuition is rising exponentially higher than health care has been rising. We've talked about this before, Dave. It's hard to justify four or five, six years of your life, maybe some significant loans, obviously opportunity costs you could have had if you'd gone the trade route or done entrepreneurship or something, to then maybe have a coin flip of a chance of graduating, 50% and less in some places, that's really difficult to justify. And Mark, please clarify that statistic. I mean, what is... For all colleges now, what is the four-year graduation rate uh, generally? It's in the 40s, Dave, you know? 40. And so when I ask yourself the question, what other economic industry in this country could survive where 60% of its prospects fail to achieve the stated goals? <laughs> well, well, literally some people don't even, you know, the statistics are quoted as six-year now just because four years so – you know, uh, in the you know atypical in certain, depending on of course where you go and type of student and type of school. Uh, there certainly are schools with graduation rates in the eighties and even nineties for four years. But uh, and then the third point, you know, is poor job prospects in certain fields. 
So, so the bottom line is, in general, colleges have to up their game. They have to up. It's, it is on them. They've been able to go for decades, decades, with the assumption on the part of parents that I don't care what it costs, but my kid just has to get a college degree because, well, this word may not have been used. It's almost the elixir that just stirs the, you know, the straw that stirs the drink that just makes everything happen in sort of an automatic type of way where it's just a foregone conclusion. And now that is being challenged and it's being challenged with data. And this is actually a good thing. It's making colleges up their graduation rates. It's making them improve their career centers and start working with an employment plan from freshman year. And it's making colleges either freeze their tuition, in some cases even reduce it, or at least have incremental increases. And really look at your budgets and ask, okay, are there where's the pork that we can cut so that we don't have to keep having these exorbitant increases? And do we really need to continue to play the facilities race and all the other races that schools do where they're trying to compete with the Joneses? My competitor has XYZ. I need to have XYZ. That's going to add cost. We'll pass it on to the consumer. So I, I just want to acknowledge that while there, there are certainly some political undertones, not even over undertones, really, it's really explicit in the article uh, in terms of persuasions and perspectives, there's a there's a legitimate point Yes, for the skepticism. When you have these levels of rising tuition, in some cases, very disappointing graduation rates, and in some cases, poor job performance. Because America's education system is so diverse, we have to be so careful not to paint with one stroke of a brush, right? Because there are schools that offer incredible value for your money on cost. And there are schools with exceptional graduation rates. And there are schools with amazing career placements. And so I don't want to just, you know, take one stroke of the brush and just indict everybody. But there's others. I mean, I had a family that reached out to me, someone I'm working with, yeah. and they said, Mark, I met such and such as a professor from a college. He made this place sound amazing. What do you think of this school? I'm not going to mention the name. You can probably tell me in a little I said, I basically said the graduation rate is in the toilet. And so, you know, buyer beware. Like, if you want to go there, maybe your child will be one of the ones who graduates. But something's wrong to have a graduation rate. And we're talking like, it was really low. So anyway, I've, I've talked a lot. Any final comments you want to make before we wrap it up? Yes, I just want to dovetail, Mark. Isn't this very uh, similar to a call to a, in the news uh, that we did a couple weeks ago, where we talked about how many colleges are adapting to these realities? Correct. There are some colleges, such as Parsons, that are saying, "Okay, let's not do a four year. We're going to give certificate programs. We're going to increase our online offerings." We're going to make our degrees far more relevant. Parsons School of Design. Hey, no one's doing design these days. It's all been offshore. But how about internet and TV and, and television and so forth? So they're offering certificate programs where people can learn real life skill sets in a short time in, in, in modes that are accessible to them uh, where they can actually address all of these things. It's, it's less cost. Um, people are are getting their their certificates and they're improving their financial possibilities and and that was key to the colleges actually surviving in this uh, tsunami demographic tsunami or not surviving their ability to address all the issues that you've raised. No, no, no. Yeah, and I'm glad you ended on a positive note. There are a lot of colleges that see the writing on the wall and they're really doing some real cutting edge things. Probably need to come back again in the next certainly 6 months, Dave. Yeah. And probably run another and you know, find another article that discusses um some of the really cool creative things that some of the colleges are doing to um you know, to increase their value because there's some really really creative thinking out there and you're right, we did discuss that. So, good stuff. Good stuff. Awesome. Awesome. Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, Miss Anika Madden, I'm feeling like we need to do the big countdown, a new countdown for you. (laughs) Three, two, and one. Can you believe it? Can you believe you have three episodes yet? 
left after almost four years. Craziness. And they're going to go by fast, so I'm going to save her every second <laughs> we have. I should like plan double length and everything just to, like, <laughs> just to get my most out of Anika before she leaves us. I'll still be yeah. here. I know you will. I know you will. I know you will. And you know we're going to get you on from time to time. But <laughs> but I know that we're going to let you go do your thing. Go fly your wings and pursue all your other gifts and talents. And mm-hmm. we support you 100% in yeah. all you're doing. So. We'll have to have you check in and give us some writing updates from time to time. Mm-hmm. That'll hold you accountable to get that writing that writing <laughs> gift in action. I got enough accountability partners, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's your way of saying no thank you. I'll consider I'll turn it, that thanks. <laughs> I'm, I've learned what I'll consider it means with you over the years. It means not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. All right. So we are uh, a couple of things. We are, of course, doing this this countdown that we've been doing here of – of the Fortune 500, you know, CEOs. And you're not going to be here to hear number one, but you're going to have to tune in to get I'll that. I'll hear it. I'll hear it. I know. I know. <laughs> so we had tied in 10th place. We had eight schools that all had five CEOs. This is a 2018 study. Where do CEOs go for undergrad? We had Yale, University of Illinois, Bucknell, University of Texas, Princeton, Lehigh, SUNY, SUNY Binghamton. You have to say that because there's 63 SUNYs. And Michigan State University. So those were all tied at five with five CEOs in the ninth spot. And then we're moving up to schools that have six. So far, we've said UPenn with six. Cal Berkeley with six. We've got two left with six. Texas A&M College Station, Mm -hmm. Texas. So I know the Aggies love that they're upping their rival Texas Longhorns there. (laughs) So they get bragging right. So there we go. All right. So we are looking at why is it so important to utilize my advisor and their knowledge? Chapter 169. And as Anika and I were talking about earlier, I really poorly actually named this chapter because what we actually do mostly in this chapter is talk about five main reasons why students don't graduate. And then, of course, make the case that the advisor, of course, could help you mm-hmm. um, stay on track. But let's talk briefly about uh, reasons people don't graduate, and then I and then I, I do want to make some comments about different types of advisors that are out there that I think a lot of our listeners may not be familiar with. So you read the chapter, Nika. What are your takeaways? Yeah, well, in your defense, I took it as the things that these are the things that you just should be talking with your advisor about, right? Good, good. So you always bail me out. So <laughs> so you gave these five, like you said, the five reasons why you don't graduate, and so what you need to be focused with your what you need to be focused on with your advisor is to really overarching is to have a plan, a four-year graduation plan. Mm-hmm. That's really, that's that was some, really all five of these up for me. But you did, you know, go drill down into, you know, not changing your major. You want to avoid changing your major so much. You want to, um, mm-hmm. and this was key because you want to make sure that your advisor is making you take more than 12 credits a semester. Because you, like you said, you did the math. And if you only take the minimum amount required, you won't graduate in four years. So let, let me stop on that. I want to hang up my hat on that a little bit. So okay. if you look at pretty much everything out there when it comes to college, it defines 12 credits as a full-time student. That is what's considered a full-time mm-hmm. student in a semester system, you know? And, and so you'll find a number of different things, you know, that are set up that way. And so it's very easy for people to say, well, I'm a, I'm a full-time student. Let me take 12. And... um. Actually, I'm going to read something from the article. It's short. It's short. So don't, don't crack on me too much. <laughs> so this is uh, from Meredith Kalodner, who's a New York Times writer, says most colleges define a full-time course load as 12, which is not coincidentally the ceiling for receiving the maximum Pell Grant and most state aid. But degrees usually require 120 credits. Do the math. Most students don't do it. And it's very difficult to catch up. You need 15 credits a semester on average to get through the four years. So what we're actually talking about here are not necessarily reasons people don't graduate, but why they don't graduate in four years. Mm-hmm. And, and so, yeah, so there's a whole movement, you know, uh, to focus on 15, uh, because if you're not getting good advising, that may not even be something you know. You go and say, hey, I'm full time. Mm-hmm. And next thing you know, the numbers just simply don't add up. Well, I just I just want to touch on one more and then you sure. can add on to it because this one is pretty darn key. And, and that's when these kids get, you know, access to all these courses that they can take. It's like, oh, my God, it's thousands of courses. And if they don't have the proper guidance, they're just willy nilly picking all these classes. And it's not counting toward their major 
you know, they're, they're majors, you know, for, for them to be, again, going back to having a four-year graduation plan. Right. Um, so being able to, with, to really work with your advisor to make sure that you're selecting the right courses and you're not taking too long to go into your major courses because, as you say, oftentimes they get filled up and you can't even get into the doggone things because you may have, I guess it's, I don't know if it's necessarily that you wait too long to try to take them, but oftentimes these classes do fill up. So you don't, you can't, so you have to wait. So that prolongs your time. Um, so I thought that was pretty important too. Yeah. So the five reasons were to hear it, why people don't graduate in four years often. Uh, first one was what I call falling into the expiration trap. And um, according to, you know, research that was done and the big article came out of USA Today on this, you know, that, that um, you know, quotes Dr. Bob Newman, former associate dean at Marquette. Um, students fall into this trap of, wow, look at all these courses. Let me explore. It's like you're, you know, and have you ever been to Wegmans before, Anika? Mm-mm. Oh, my goodness. This is my favorite grocery store. <laughs> and I'm already envious of Joy because where she's going to live in Raleigh, there's she's 0.9 miles from a Wegmans. Mm. And we don't have a Wegmans here where we are, but I did have one in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. So it's one of these grocery stores that's like, think of like every imaginable thing in the grocery aisle, but then they have the prepared section looks like a food court at a mall. But, you know, I never lost my sweet tooth. And so I would go right to the big giant candy bins. Mm-hmm. Even, even, even when we're back on Westchester on vacation, I'm going right back to those candy bins. And just, I'm like a kid in the candy store, just exploring and just, I'm going to take, and I come out with a huge order. So anyway, <laughs> that's what it reminds me of. You're like a kid in a candy store. All these courses, it's so much different than high school. I'm just going to go crazy, you know, not really putting together a plan. So that's a reason. Another reason is not actually having a four-year plan. You should actually map out a full four-year plan. You know, and this is stuff you do with the advisor. Now, it may change, but at least you have a plan. We've already talked about the 12 credit fallacy. You know, fallacy. You just need 12 credits. Constantly changing your majors. That'll kill you. You keep changing your major. And then by by the time you do that, every major has different requirements. That's why I like to do a lot of career um, surveys and interest surveys. I now do five with every student I work with, Anika. Five. And assess them all just to do our best. And not only that, I do a series of other things, too do our best to get somebody on the right major path so that they don't constantly change their major because 80% of people, according to major research, change their major in college. Mm -hmm. And depending on what major you change or when you change it, that might involve, okay, another 12 credits, another four credits, another 16 credits, you know, and and then the one you also mentioned is not scheduling wisely. So you have to kind of learn the system for each school that you're at. A lot of schools, if you're smart, you can use their drop, drop ad time period. And you can get in there and get courses, but you have to really plan because, you know, Joy's great. She's a great planner, but she'll find out like, okay, this, this course, I needed to graduate and it's only offered in the spring. And so if I fool around and wait, I may not get it and have to delay my um, graduation. Hmm. So those are all the reasons. And then I mentioned excellent advising is what really will be the key for you not falling into these traps. Anything else you want to add? Mm-mm, no, I think those are key. All right, so let me let me mention something about the advising. College is not like high school. So in high school, depending on what school you go to, let's just put it this way, some high schools, especially smaller schools, smaller private, smaller charter schools, somebody might reach out to you and say, listen, you need to come in and talk to me. This is not just how it works in college. There's all this advising there, but you need to be the one to be proactive. And um, the single biggest thing, thing I try to work with students on is self-advocacy. It's the single biggest thing because all of the resources are going to be there, but don't expect anybody hunting you down if you don't take advantage of the advising resources that are there. Right. And so anything you can do as a parent to help your student develop self-advocacy skills, you're really preparing them for how college is. You know, when I was a teacher, I would throw out things like, I would say like a bonus for the person that does blah, 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 and it's due in two or three months. And I'm not I'm not telling you again. And I would just see who would like do the assignment. And I just did different things to try to, you know, encourage self-advocacy. If we were taking a school trip, let's say we're going to visit colleges, you know, I would create a scenario where any student who turns their assignment in three days early, then, you know, they get sometimes I even like paid for their Chick-fil-A, you know. <laughs> those are times I was hoping not too many people took me up on it, (laughs) but I would just do different things. Then I would highlight the winners. See, I just trying to teach self-advocacy. So let me just go over the list of 
advisors that are out there. Now, not every college has all of these. Do you know, Anika, I sat down, I came up with a list, and, and I'm sure I missed some because I, I was, you know, just brainstorming. Um, I came up with 12 different advisors. Well, you know what? Until Janae told me she had, it seems like 12. I didn't realize mm-hmm. there were so many until then. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, exactly. So, so some schools have an academic advisor that s- starts working with you before orientation, mm-hmm. right after enrollment. It's like a faculty advisor. It can be a dean, a professor, an academic advisor right away on transition, on course selection, on everything. So that's one. You have your main assigned personal advisor. Some schools have a sophomore advisor. If you're looking at doing study abroad, there's a study abroad coordinator or slash advisor. Uh, Some schools, Brown's a school that has this, have like an experiential learning or a public service advisor. So if you want to do things like internships, the community service, research, they have an experiential learning advisor. Some, most schools have some type of career center advisor at the career center. A lot of schools have a medical advisor if you're looking on going into a pre-med track. Uh, Something that's very, very common you'll find a lot of schools have is a peer advisor, Mm -hmm. a a student who's in the peer advisor role. role. If you're at a co-op school, there's almost always a co-op advisor that advises you on co-op and you know, and, and selecting the right one and housing and all that kind of stuff. It's very common to have a specific advisor for your major or department, uh, a major advisor. And then like Ohio State is an example of a school that has like a, you have a, an advisor for your minor. If you minor in something, you have a minor advisor and a major advisor. And then for those of you who are in honors colleges, there can be an honors college advisor. So the schools are set up to have all these incredible resources. I mean, earlier Dave and I talked about some schools have low graduation rates and some have high. One of the reasons why the high ones have high is because they've put the personnel in place to keep you from falling through the cracks. But it won't do you any good if you don't reach out and use them. That's right. Anything else you want to say? No, like I said, Janelle. No, Janelle. She has at least five. I know she does. Um, See? She went through her list. So and, Good and for the, her. And the peer advisor was one of them. I know she has a peer advisor. So, yep. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yep. And it is keeping her on track, by the way. <laughs> See? So, the lesson out there is tap into your resources of the advisor. Don't let that be an unutilized resource. If, mm-hmm. you know, because you there's no way your kid knows as much as these individuals do about how to navigate your way through the school. Right. Take advantage of them rather than learning by banging your head up against the brick. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> no, it hurts, by the way. It's not fun also. <laughs> All right, Anika, we're in the countdown. You only have two more chapters. Two Although more two, chapters. You know, I'm, I have to admit, I'm going to be happy to be done the book. <laughs> <laughs> See, the silver lining in the cloud. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so we have three questions from a listener left with our beloved Anika. So take this one away. I love this question. It's a longer question, but it's a really good one. So why don't you read it and we'll dive in. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. So this is Jennifer from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And Jennifer says she has a son who's a junior in high school. Mm-hmm. And he plays football at a large school in Oklahoma, um, mm-hmm. which the school is the largest football. Is she says it, his school is in the largest football division and won the state championship in 2019, and was a semifinalist in 2020. His coach considers the program a college prep football program, although he is not interested in playing college football, but really enjoys playing in high school. During the season, he spends 30 to 35 hours a week at football between August and November. And mm-hmm. during the off season, it's about 15 hours a week. And that is including the summer. And she, she goes on to say football is his last class of the day and then an hour or four after school. And she says they cannot miss practice for any reason, which means he can't attend any kind of club meeting after school all year long. And this really limits her. Well, her primary concern is that this really limits what he can participate in. Plus, he just doesn't have a lot of time for multiple other activities. How does this look on a college application slash ROTC scholarship? He can demonstrate. How can he demonstrate his level of commitment to that one activity to explain his lack of other activities? He is a member of NHS and Société Honoraire de France. Okay. Ooh, you're pretty good at the French. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. All right. So first of all, shout out to Jennifer for a great question. And first thing I'll say is 
this is not new at all to any to college admissions counselors. They are when I say this, the antecedent of this is a student that has an inordinate amount. I'll use that term of a time commitment to some type of activity, and they're not going to end up doing it in college. Like let me just case in point. Just just take a look at football across the country. Over a million people play football. Over a million boys play high school football, and actually only 6.9%, according to the NCAA, play at the next level, meaning 93% plus don't play. And that's actually low compared to some other sports because football has 85 positions, 85 scholarship slots at some schools and 65 at others. Hmm. So other sports, you'll see numbers like 1 in 2% of people that play in high school go on to play in college. And there are a lot of niche sports like gymnastics where people are doing four to six hours a day. There's marathon runners. And then nowadays, just youth sports has gotten so serious. People are doing volleyball. They're doing club volleyball. They're doing LAX, which is an acronym for what's, you know, abbreviation for lacrosse. And and this stuff's taking up all your time. And I look at Joy when she played basketball. You know, she it was a full 12-month commitment. She was traveling nationally, playing close to 100 games a year, counting what she did on, she on a very high-level AAU team, second ranked in Georgia, one of the top in the country. I mean, completely time consuming. I could never have done the podcast, Anika, when Joy was doing all that stuff. There's no way. That's me as a parent, let alone her. Right. So the but the point is colleges are used to this. I have to tell you this story. So the student I worked with, this is I'm starting to show my age on this stuff. So this is back in 2003. His name is Cyrus. Shout out to Cyrus. So Cyrus was unbelievable at the violin. And actually he went on to play at Columbia where he went to college. So, you know, he had to be good, but Cyrus would get up at five in the morning and practice. And this, I'll never forget. So he he put in four hours a day of practice, but this is the thing I'll never forget. He told me if he missed one day, he could tell that he was rusty Mm. one day. Is that incredible? So the point is there's a lot of people out here that are putting a lot of time in on their activities and colleges are very used to that. So that's the first thing. And by the way, Oklahoma, anyone who does any admissions, even people that don't do admissions know Oklahoma is already a football crazed state. So you're you're on one of those kinds of top tier teams in Oklahoma. Any admission officer kind of knows the time commitment that's involved in that. So that's the first thing that I'll say. Second thing I'll say is an admission officer will love that you are involved in something. You're not just eating Doritos, watching Netflix. Mm -hmm. Okay, the way an admission officer assesses a student is what are they likely to do if they come to our campus? Okay, and the fact that you've been very involved, it bodes well for predicting that you're the kind of person who will get very involved on their campus, which is what they're looking for. So it's a myth that the only way a school will know that you'll be involved in something is that you have a demonstrated track record of being involved in that same thing. And if they don't see this, the the involvement in that same activity that you, you're you going to do in the college level, then they'll ding you. That's a myth. That so frequently is the case where somebody will get involved in something very different from what they were involved in in high school. So the first thing is they're going to see the level of time commitment. And that's also going to partly impact their academic, academic assessment as well. Because when they look at your grades and everything, they're going to take into consideration you're doing all of that with Basically, a full-time job on the side. 35 hours, a full-time job. Hmm. So it'll also assess, it'll also impact, you know, now I remind you, I'm talking about schools that do holistic admissions. There are a lot of schools out there that just crunch numbers. You have the GPA, you're in, you, ha- you don't have it, you're not in. In, 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 the, in the previous world of test requirements, it was GPA and test scores. In this world we're in, it's mostly just the GPA and the, and the courses. So I'm not talking about those schools. I'm talking about schools that do holistic admissions. They're going to look at all of these kinds of things, you know. Now, the question is, are there any things that you can do to sort of get the more favorable read given this background? And I would absolutely say that there are some things that you can do. Any idea what I would what I would say are some of the things you can do, Anika? Mm-mm, because I'm thinking that it's a favorable read because he's committed to something. Yeah, but but you can take it to the next level. Okay. So being committed to something is already really good because you're showing commitment Mm -hmm. and being committed to something and hopefully having good grades is already really, really good. But there are a few things you can take do to take it to the next level. And two in particular, one is 
I strongly implore you to make sure that your son communicates that level of involvement in the application because you can't assume that they know all of it. Like, yeah, they're going to know football, Oklahoma, really good team. They're going to know a lot. But the, some of the details that that were shared in the question that Jennifer, you know, those are things that her son should share. Mm-hmm. OK, so that's the first thing is I want you to make them aware of the involvement. And if there's a relationship with a counselor, I would ask if the counselor could include it. It would almost be better. Not almost. It would be better coming from the counselor. Okay. If the counselor is able to include the amount of time commitment. That would be a great thing to do. So I would encourage that. So the one, so don't assume they know it, even that they most likely will. Spell it out. That's the one thing. The second thing, and this is, to me, even more important than the first thing. This is what I do with all students I'm working with who have either one activity they were fixated on, or I sometimes I have students that haven't had that much activities at all. And what I always tell them to do is identify something at that school that you are extremely interested in. And that should pop off your application. So let me give you an example. I'm going to go in a completely different direction. Let's say that what Jennifer's son is really interested in is community service with autistic kids. I don't want it to make it concrete. So that's why I just threw something out there rather than just say any activity, right? Community service with autistic kids. Now, normally you would think, well, if if they want, if you're interested in community service with autistic kids, like where's the track record of you having done that in high school? But we know why he couldn't do that because of the time commitment. So here's what I would want him to do. I would want him to, first of all, find out what those opportunities are at the colleges you're interested in. Find out the clubs, the names of the clubs, what they do. Reach out to a leader of the club, faculty advisor, students, interact with them. And then when you're talking about the activity, explain that. I'm very interested in the Autistic Community Service Club. I had a fantastic conversation with the president, George Jackson. He told me they go into the community every other Saturday and they, you know, and so, so, so interact with people, whether it's a adult or students, and incorporate that into your description of what you want to do because now they will really believe that they can see you doing it because you went way beyond what most people do. You went out of your way to talk to people in the club, find out what they do, describing activity to, t- activities to us about what they do. Because from a college admission standpoint, the past is the past. I'm just interested in what you're going to do on my campus. And so if you go to the extent where you, in your research, where you're actually talking to people involved in things that you're interested in and you're communicating to us I'm interested in this club or this activity, you know, and you share, you know, what you actually did to learn about that activity. And if you go, I mean, you you certainly could do it by just talking about what's on the web. But next level stuff, this is one, one thing I've learned from my kids. They always say, that's next level. That's the term. <laughs> that's next level. So I've incorporated my vocabulary, but of course they say I'm not allowed to use it. So next level would be to interact with somebody who actually is involved in the activity and communicate in your application what you learn from your interaction with them and why that excites you. Because what that does for me as an admission officer is that gives me a high degree of confidence that you're going to get involved. And what I always like to do when I, when I was in admissions, I like to identify two things or two areas where I can see the person would get involved. That also that, you know, I don't know for sure. There's no guarantee, but there, I'd like a student to convince me of two areas where I can see them getting involved and getting plugged in. And one area with a lot of zest and passion and gusto is is great as well. So does that make sense, Anika? Or is that confusing? Kind of. It's not confusing, but I'm not sure. Are you telling her to for the son to identify some interest at the school? Some interest at the college. At the college itself. Because it's not because it sounds like to me that her kid is all about football. So he may genuinely not have an interest in. And, and I'm, I know you're using that as an example, but he just may not have any other interests. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. 
I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length. Usually it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that $5,000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. So I didn't interpret it that way. I, t- I interpreted her question as he just hasn't had time to do anything else. Well, and, and that's my point. I'm not saying that he didn't want to. I'm just saying that's right. literally all he's been involved with. So the right. question is because the way I take that as a parent is that I cringe when I try to get my kid to think of something that they like. And they're like, oh, my God, I don't know. So here's the thing with that. So here's the thing with that. If football is his thing, then he can reach out in the football area. He can look, he can reach out for opportunities to get involved in volunteerism and helping the football. Like, you know, Kara, one thing Karis loved doing when she was in college, she, in, in high school, she was the, like the manager for the basketball team for four years. And so when she went to Davidson, she reached out to Davidson and she ended up being like the assistant manager for the basketball, for basketball there. Cause that was something that she loved. She loved doing that stuff. She loved getting Getting the water bottles and getting, you know, on the tape and getting all that stuff for like just ser- serving the players and, and being on the bench and being part of the experience. She loved that. And she did it in high school. And she reached out to the people at Davidson and she did it in college. And so if his thing is football and that's what he loves, then I wouldn't, you know, I used an autistic example earlier, but he probably loves being around football and doing football things. So Look for opportunities to serve or get involved in football, even if it's not being a player. Mm. I, I don't believe that a student has no interests. It's just like when someone comes to me and they say they don't they hate reading. I don't believe them. I tell them when someone says I hate reading, I say I don't believe them. I say, you know what I believe? I believe you have not found a topic yet right. that you love enough to realize you actually do like them because everybody has interests. And when they realize that, oh, I can learn about this. Then all of a sudden they can become interested. So I don't believe he has no interests. Now he may have no interest that he's cognizant of. He's aware of. He may need some prompting and some coaching and some guiding from someone who works with him. Like you, you know, let's just call him Jack. Sorry, Jennifer. We're calling your son Jack for the example. (laughs) Hope hope you don't hate the name Jack because he's Jack for now. (laughs) Sorry. So let's say, you know, so, you know, you might have to work with Jack and, and say, you know, Jack, you, you know, you've always enjoyed, you know, whatever, name what it is related to football, like weightlifting. You've always enjoyed like the summer camps. Remember how much you love going to summer camps? You know, let's see if you can arrange to be involved in helping the college with the summer. camp. I mean, whatever it is, people have interests. They may not know what those are. They may need help having being prompted toward what those are. But I just don't believe that somebody has no interest. And I didn't pick up anything in Jennifer's question that says, I don't know what to do with my son. He has zero interest. He either wants to play football or do nothing. That's not what I took it. That's that's not how I took it either. I'm just saying that that was what he did. Like that was Correct. his life. So I guess for me, I'm I'm thinking of the way you pro- like. How do you just like you said? How do you work with your kid to identify what it is that they can potentially have interest in? So I think the but for me, the easier way would be to look at okay, let's look at the school and let's just see what they have. Let's just, and then just start pride in that way. Like, ooh, look at that. You might like paper making or you might like whatever. But maybe that'll help. So you can do it either way. You can start with the school or you can start with yourself. Mm-hmm. If you start with yourself and a lot of the thing, there are a lot of things that every school is going to have, right? So if we identify that he really likes football, uh, let's assume he's going to a college that has football. There's going to be lots of opportunities to get involved in some capacity with the team. He might and be it may not be. By the way. <laughs> no, it's not. Okay, Nate, you're being difficult. Is this how the last three episodes are going to go? 
You gotta pre- I gotta press go the out envelope. with a bang. I gotta go out you with a bang. You sure are. <laughs> <laughs> Shooting down everything no, but, I come no, up with. The, no, because the reality is just, it's hard sometimes for parents. Because I, I remember going through these exercises with trying to figure out what are your what's your passion. That was a whole kip thing. Yeah. Well, let's get what your passion is. And that is not an easy task. No. Like that isn't. is not easy at all. So I'm just trying to, you know, help to, you know, just all the different ways to do it. Like you said, start with yourself, start with the school, start with whatever, but it's a lot easier said than done. I know that. It, well, well, so, so here's, here's where this is actually easier than what you're talking about. Cause what you're talking about is finding a passion that really is a passion and you sticking with it. So you're not squandering time and wasting time doing something that you don't have any interest in. This is something that it's important that you do it with authenticity and integrity, meaning I don't want you just saying something to a college that you think they want to hear you have no interest in. That's number one, right? Right. But you can say what you genuinely think you'd be interested in. And if you change your mind, nobody did anything wrong and it's not held against you. Whereas in what you're talking about, like, let's say you're trying to find out your passion for your kid and you think it's going to be, you know, well, let's say track or softball or something. And then you, you know, join a club and spend money and do this and travel. And then you find out they hate it then you feel like you've wasted time and money. So with this, it's how you're presenting yourself in your application. And you will do your best to do it with authenticity and integrity. But if at the end of the day, you decide that whatever you indicated you were interested in, you choose not to be interested in, there's not the same consequence as someone who, you know, you know, invested a lot of money in, in, whatever and violin lessons for their kid and then they hate it and they bought a viol expensive violin and they paid for <laughs> lessons and now you feel like you're out money and time does that make sense so yeah it does yeah so so it's not i mean it's not as quite as high stakes game as what you were talking about like you're talking about it's really hard to get you're you're talking about it's really hard to get the passion right mm-hmm. right and here it's not as important that you get it right as it is that you do something with integrity. Mm. And, and, well, you, and you, yeah, you change your mind, you change your mind. There's no real ramifications to to you changing your mind. Where in your example, there could be a loss of time and money. Mm, yeah, could be. That was a weak little meow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is this part of you being difficult the no, last no, two weeks? No, it's not. Because I, I also <laughs> okay. think about my own one of my own close babies who mm-hmm. just to get him to identify interest. And, and, you know, forget passion, just interest. It was just like, really? Like, come on. Mm-hmm. And he's and he kind of sort of still that way. And so, I mean, it's unfortunate, but it's a reality. So I just know it's kind of tough. No, I mean, it certainly is certainly there's certainly some people that know what they want much more than others. Yeah, for sure. You know, and and um, but hopefully, Jennifer, you got some answers for Jack. For your child. <laughs> Jack Jennifer is going to send in another question. She's going to say, don't call my son Jack again. <laughs> I can just see it right now. I didn't getting, do it, getting Jennifer. Bra- I did getting it. braced for that one. Did not, was not Anika. <laughs> <laughs> and now, this week's interview with a special guest. All right, friend. Very, very excited to have Mark Cantrowich back. And people don't get invited back a second time um, to your club and kid unless... That was a tremendous response to the first time. And I was actually looking at some Google Analytics stuff from our website, Dave. And uh, Mark uh, Cantor, which is um, interview the first time when he was on our podcast, when he talked about his book on how to appeal your aid award, it was actually the most uh, listened to interview uh, from people that like to look, listen directly from the website. So happy to have Mark back. I've said before. I've learned more about the financial aid process from him than anybody else. And many people consider him the most knowledgeable person in the country. So it's a real honor to have him back. Now, in part one of what would be a four-parter, Mark starts with a brief bio, and then he introduces our topic of FAFSA simplification. Mark explains the history of why the FAFSA is being overhauled, what led to it. He talks about how the FAFSA will be going from literally Um, 108 questions to 36 questions. And how are they going to be able to ensure accuracy by chopping off literally 70% of the questions? And then he talks about some of the things that are getting rid of that were previously asked that won't be asked anymore. And he talks about when FAFSA simplification goes into effect. He talks about why the new FAFSA gets rid of the term EFC and won't be using it anymore. 
And he explains what the new student aid index is and how it can be a negative number. That is below $0. It can have a negative 2,000 student aid index or negative 1,000 student aid index. Listen and enjoy what will be part one of a four-part interview. Friends, we are in for a treat today. Mark Kantrowitz, who was with us, oh, a year, year and a half ago to talk about his excellent book on how to appeal for more financial aid, is back. Welcome back to the Your College Bound Kid podcast, Mark. Thank you for having me. And friends, I, you know, I honestly believe this, and I don't believe I'm embellishing. I believe I'm speaking to the most knowledgeable person in the world when it comes to how the financial aid works at U.S. colleges. And I believe if a national survey was taken, there'd be support for that. I could take a half an hour easily to read Mark's bio. I'm not going to do that, but I do want to just mention a few highlights. So Mark writes extensively about student financial aid policy. He's testified before Congress and federal state agencies about student aid on several occasions. Mark has been quoted in more than, and this is the the real number here, 10,000 newspaper and magazine articles. He's written for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Reuters, Huffington Post, U.S. News and World Report, Money Magazine, Bottom Line, Forbes, Newsweek, and Time Magazine. He was named a money hero by Money Magazine, a college financing ace by Investment Advisor Magazine. He's the author of five best-selling books about scholarships and financial aid, including How to Appeal for More College Financial Aid, Twisdoms About Paying for College, Filing the FAFSA, and Secrets to Winning a Scholarship. And Mark is currently the publisher of Private Student Loans Guru, a website that provides students with smart borrowing tips about private loans. And Mark, I'm proud to say I have all your books. Thank you. So you've been a real um, blessing for, what, 30 years now, is it, you've been dedicating yourself to this? I've been doing this for decades. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Awesome. So without any further ado, let's dive in. And today we're going to talk about FAFSA simplification. And rather than have Mark do a presentation... I'm going to just sort of guide us into the content by using a question and answer format. So let's dive in. So according to John Fansmith, American Council of Education's Director of Government Relations, uh, 1.2 million people start a FAFSA each year and never finish it. And according to Kim Clark, Executive Director of NCAN, in 2018, graduating high school students left $2.6 billion in Pell Grants unclaimed because they didn't complete the FAFSA. So Mark... From your research, do you agree with those statistics, and do you agree that FAFSA needed an overhaul and needed to be simplified? Well, I have a slightly larger figure for the number of students who are leaving money on the table. And each year, about 2 million students who would have qualified for a federal Pell Grant don't file the FAFSA. Wow. And of them, 1.2 million would have qualified for the maximum Pell Grant. Oh, so the 1.2 is the max. Yeah, they're they're certainly leaving money on the table. Um, And part of the reason is the FAFSA is far too complicated. It's more complicated than federal income tax returns. Right. In surveys, about 10% of the students say the form is too complicated. But uh, what people say and what people do might might be two entirely different things and the reason why they don't file it. But certainly, it is a really complicated form takes 30 to 60 minutes to complete the form, assuming you've gathered information in advance. Yeah, and I've heard from financial aid directors anywhere from 30 to 40% of the time there are errors. Have have you seen statistics, um, anything like that, or close to that from your research? Well, a lot of the information on the FAFSA can be transferred directly from your federal income tax return into the FAFSA. Right. So if you use this IRS data retrieval tool, the error rate goes down a lot. Right. In the past, as many as 30% of FAFSAs were selected for verification. Mm -hmm. These days, it's about 18%. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an error correction process where the college asks you to provide documentation behind a number on the FAFSA. Mm -hmm. And clearly, any information that's transferred from the IRS isn't subject to verification because it's assumed to be correct. Right. This can um, make it... I mean, easier on the students. And the problem with the FAFSA is not only is it a complicated form that can be difficult for low-income students, students who are first in their family to go to college to complete, but then once you submit the form, you're subjected to verification. So you have Mm -hmm. to prove that you're poor twice. Right. 
And, th- and there are some students who don't complete verification, not because they're not eligible, but because every time you establish another barrier that they have to overcome, it causes some students to not finish the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let, let's talk about the history of how this bill emerged. I mean, I know former Senator Alexander of Tennessee played a pretty big role, Senator Pat Murray. Um, talk about any other people or events or anything you want to highlight um, that sort of got us to the history of where we are today. And I know this um, FAFSA Simplification Act is actually part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act, right? So it's not the whole uh, bill in of itself. But I'd love to hear sort of the history of what got us to where we are today from your perspective. So Senator Alexander has been a strong proponent of FAFSA simplification for most of his career. And he very famously has a printed out version of the FAFSA where every page is taped to the previous page. And then he lets it loose in a waterfall of a lot of pages and to make the point that it's just too complicated. And it is more complicated than federal income tax returns. And Senator Patty Murray, the... uh, Ranking member at the time, uh, she was also a proponent of FAFSA simplification. The National College Attainment Network, previously known as National College Access Network, is also known by its acronym NCAN. Mm-hmm. They've also been strong proponents of FAFSA simplification and showing the impact of the complexity on FAFSA completion. So Senator Alexander was scheduled to retire at the end of the most recent session of Congress, as he did. And so as a kind of going away present for him, they included FAFSA simplification uh, in this piece of legislation, the last piece of legislation enacted. Uh, The Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 is by far the largest piece of federal legislation ever enacted. It was around 6,000 pages long. Of that, about more than 160 pages of that were devoted to FAFSA simplification. So it takes a lot of pages of legislation to implement a simpler FAFSA. No, that's very helpful. That's very helpful. Now, one of the things we know is you went from 108 questions in the, well, I guess the current FAFSA, to 36 questions. So that's almost two-thirds reduction. How are they able to get rid of so many questions and still ensure accuracy? So... It is a two-thirds reduction in the number of questions. Now, part of this is by better aligning the FAFSA with federal income tax returns. Mm-hmm. So the answers to more questions can be answered using tax data. And they use the prior, prior year federal income tax returns from two years prior, mm-hmm. which is the one that you are filing before you file the FAFSA, so that most people will have already filed their federal income tax returns by the time it one wants to complete the FAFSA. In addition, uh, they looked at the questions that how many people had to answer each question. And for questions where it was less than 1% of the applicants completing them, they they thought seriously, do we really need this question? And they got rid of a bunch of questions like that. They also got rid of questions that really didn't have anything to do with eligibility for need-based financial aid. For example, there was a question about whether you had been convicted of the sale or possession of illegal drugs while receiving federal student aid. Mm -hmm. And people have been arguing that that question should have been dropped a long time ago because it doesn't really relate to your ability to pay for college. It's extraneous. They also uh, got rid of the requirement that male students must register with Selective Service before filing the FAFSA. Otherwise, they're not eligible for federal student aid. Now, they're still required to register with Selective Service, but that question does not show up on the FAFSA. And if they haven't registered, they're still eligible for federal student aid, though some states uh, still won't give you state aid if you haven't registered with Selective Service. So it's important that male students do that. Mm, Good points there. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, our recommended resource for episode 169 is an outstanding book called Paying for College 2021. And the subtitle is Everything You Need to Maximize Financial Aid 
and afford college. Friends, for years, this has been my number one comprehensive book when it comes to paying for college. And quite honestly, I'm flabbergasted and and embarrassed that it took me almost four years on our podcast to recommend this book to you. It is the only book I know of that has updated line-by-line instructions on how to fill out the FAFSA. Now, the book was formerly called Paying for College Without Going Broke, so it's been rebranded. And the book deals with both long-term and short-term strategies on how to receive more money. My favorite chapter is Chapter 9 that deals with special circumstances that emerge. And the book is published annually by Princeton Review with updates every year. So there'll be a 2022 version as well. We'll now return to my interview with Mark Kantrowitz. Now, you mentioned a few things before. You mentioned prior, prior year. Talk to us about when FAFSA simplification goes into effect and explain prior, prior year for someone that may not understand it and and also the concept of base year. So the FAFSA simplification goes into effect starting with the 2023-24 academic year. People will start filing the FAFSA for 2023-24 on October 1st of 2022. And because of prior, prior year, the 2023-24 FAFSA will be based on 2021 income and tax information, which is this year. And now people who are filing the in federal income tax returns for 2021 will file them by typically April 15 of 2022. Now, if you get an extension, you can get an automatic extension of filing your federal income tax returns for up to six months, which would put you into October 15 of 2022. Well, the fastest start date is October 1st of 2022. So it's much better aligned. Before 2017, 18, the FAFSA was based on prior income, which meant that people were filing their tax returns and the FAFSA at the same time, which was kind of a mess. This way, almost everybody is going to be able to use IRS data for completing their FAFSAs. Yeah, and you hear 23, 24, and it sounds like it's way off in the future. Um, that's current 10th graders, but it's 2021. That's where we are now. And so it'll be this year this year's income that will be um, applicable. So, you know, for those who are thinking this is uh, way out in the future, it's, it's actually really honest right now. The future is now. And it gives the U.S. Department of Education some time to implement the changes because it's going to be a fair amount of work to, to make these changes, even though it's omitting a lot of information from before. And the hope is that they will um, be able to get more people's IRS data for the form. And currently, if you were you're married now, but you weren't married two years ago, well, you'd have separate federal income tax returns. And for some reason, the IRS wasn't able to add. <laughs> well, now they'll be able to, they'll have the time to implement that change so that they can take the two tax returns and add them together. Or more complicated, if you filed a joint return two years ago and now you're separated or divorced, well, they can base it on a um, 50-50 split of the joint return or um, in proportion to your income from W-2 and 1099 statements. They, they have the time to implement that. Makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the changes a lot of us are excited about is just semantics, but it's kind of actually important because it's so confusing. Uh, we know they're getting rid of the term EFC and replacing it with SAI. Can you explain um, what EFC was and why this change is being made to the term SAI and the significance of this? So EFC stands for expected family contribution. And it's a bit of a misnomer. People think, oh, that's all I'm going to have to pay, the family contribution. When in fact, most families pay more than the EFC. They, um, and not every college meets full demonstrated financial need. And even when they do, most colleges use loans to help you pay for college, and, and loans are, are not gift aid. They have to be repaid usually with interest. They actually increase your college costs. And so you have the unmet need and you have the loans. That adds beyond the EFC. And it was felt that this was misleading to families. So now they're switching to the term student aid index. 
uh, to communicate that this is a, a measure of your ability to pay, but it's not the amount you're actually going to pay. It's a different set of terminology. Uh, and its acronym is SAI. Um, it's still going to be the same underlying formula, though they're dropping a lot of questions. And they're adding some secondary formulas for like Pell Grant eligibility. But it's, it's just a new name for the old concept. You're, you're still going to measure financial need by subtracting either the EFC, old WAP method, or the student aid index, the new method, from the college's cost of attendance. That difference is your financial need. And then the colleges award financial aid from a variety of sources, federal, state, the college's own money, to cover at least part of that financial need. Yeah, and, 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 and it might be semantics, but it's kind of a really important one, in my opinion, because the whole concept was so confusing. You're saying family contribution. Like you said, most of the time, most schools don't meet full demonstrated need, or if they do, they do with loans and work study. Then you have other schools that are using the CSS profile and using institutional methodology. Uh, there's even potential for someone getting merit money going beyond EFC. So it just very rarely was somebody ever paying their family contribution. So I think this is a welcome change. We still have the general issue that financial aid is an alphabet soup of acronyms. I know. So instead of mm -hmm. EFC, we have SAI. I know. We have the SAR, <laughs> the student aid report. I know. Uh, that we have the FAFSA. So it's like learning a new language. And that can be intimidating to some families. But at least the process is going to be a little simpler. No, your point is well taken. It, there still could be a long ways we could go towards simplification. And he said, you just threw out three or four acronyms. We could easily have 50 to 100 here and keep going. Um, another concept that's new is that this new SAI can be negative, right? It could be negative 1,500 where before the lowest in EFC could be was zero. Can you explain this change and why it occurred? And do you think it's a good change? Just to shed, shed some light on this. Well, students who have a zero EFC, whether it's a calculated EFC or an automatic zero EFC, tend to be um, well distributed according to income. Some of them are earning the poverty line. Some of them are earning well below the poverty line. So the intention is to allow differentiation among those who have a zero EFC to include those who have I mean, extreme poverty as opposed to just being poor. So low income and extremely low income. Now, the negative SAI isn't going to yield more federal student aid. They made sure that in an SAI of negative 1,500 is going to be treated the same as a zero SAI. But maybe it allows some colleges to award more financial aid to the students who have a negative SAI. It will also provide data to show that they, there really is a – it's not just the unmet need that where the colleges are gapping the students. It's also there are students uh, who even if they get the full – federal student, full college financial aid, are still going to be left with uh, some needs that aren't being met. Next week is news, Is There a Bias Against Asian College Applicants? An article by Andrew Belasco of College Transitions. Mark and Anika will discuss how can I avoid common financial pitfalls? Next week is bonus content. Well, Mark will discuss what is the admission funnel. Our interview is part two of four with Mark Kantrowitz on the new simplified FAFSA. And Dr. Lisa Ruff is going to be giving us the college spotlight. It comes from my own backyard, DePaul University, where Lisa will answer the existential question why can't DePaul recruit good Chicago basketball players? We're so excited <laughs> to hear that answer, Lisa. <laughs> don't be over-promising, man. You don't know what she's going to say. <laughs> well, that's all we care about with DePaul, really. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's in the Anika mode of not being the sports people you are, and you and I are, Dave. She's fitting, fitting that role perfectly. <laughs> Lisa, I want to just give you a bit of nonsense to... to uh, <laughs> to focus on next week. <laughs> <laughs>
Awesome. Have a good week, my friend. You too, my friend. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please subscribe so you get every episode as soon as it is released. If you are interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on your favorite podcast listening app. I am the producer of the Your College Bound Kid podcast. We have a fantastic team of nine people. Shout out to our three co-hosts, Anika Madden, Dr. David Williams, and Dr. Lisa Ruff. Our sound engineer, who fixes all of our many errors, is Nemanja Montfitch. The amazing music you hear is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Our image editor is Talha Khan. And our webmaster is Talianos Dimitri. If you want to have a college coaching session with me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want to ask or a college you want Lisa or me to do a spotlight on, or if you have a recommended resource or an article you think we should share, just send it to questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you, our family, next week. <laughs>